Welcome to the Half Blood Report. The place for Percy Jackson news, interviews, and all things right. I'm Samuel, your co host. And I'm Diego, your other co host. And this is a really special episode because today we are joined by an incredibly awesome guest. Roshani Chakshi is the author of the Aru Cha series from McRiden Presents, if you don't know that already. The third book in the series uh, just came out this past week. Rosh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, we're both really big fans of the series, and we're so thankful you agreed to come on and talk about the new book. To start off, um, you were the first Rick Riordan Presents author, and how did and how does that feel, uh, seeing as you kind of had to set the tone for the emperor? Oh my gosh, uh, absolutely no pressure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I gotta be honest, I actually heard that Rick was even starting an imprint I think it was in 2016 and I was at Dragon Con in Atlanta uh, where I, my husband and I live and Dragon Con is delightful. I mean, sometimes the stormtroopers just like raid the highway, which isn't as great, but it's still just really, really fun. And I thought, I thought somebody was lying. <laughs> they were just like, as you hear, he's starting this imprint. He's looking for stories that have like the feel of Percy Jackson, but are written by authors of that culture. And so I just, went home as fast as I could, which was very hard to do because Atlanta traffic is, I think its own circle of hell. And um, (laughs) I emailed my agent. I was like, I think this is a thing. I really want to do it. Um, And I wrote only three chapters before Arusha was picked up. And this is, I think my third book or so. This was my third book. Um, And on all the times that I've ever been on submission with a publisher, it has taken a really long time. You know, I've waited six months before anybody wanted to publish my very first book, The Star Touched Queen. And with Aru, it took less than a week. And I remember getting the phone call or the email that Rick had the book. And, and that he had it in his hands. And I was like, what is he doing with it? Is he going to like smash insects with it? Or I don't know, just <laughs> throw it into the water? I had no idea. But it never occurred to me that he would actually read it, much less edit it. Um, and then turn into someone who I do actually consider a friend. He's so friendly and so generous and just an awesome human being. So, yeah, it was a ton of pressure. Three chapters, and all of a sudden, they're just like, you're first. <laughs> you're just sitting there. <laughs> I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> um, but I was really lucky to work with some incredible people at Disney. My editor and, of course, Rick gave me wonderful feedback on the story. They just helped improve my craft. And I think with Aru, it was the first time that I didn't actually ask friends to read it. I I have a wonderful network of critique partners, but there was something really special about Aru where I just didn't want to mess with her voice be, beyond what I had shared with my editor and Rick. And so in that way, the experience was really isolating, but also, you know, obviously a lot of pressure on it, but, um, but I just felt really freed writing that book. I don't know how else to put it. Wow. wow. That, I mean, that sounds awesome, but a little... <laughs> Uh, it's probably still a lot of anxiety that comes with that. Oh my gosh, so much anxiety, so much. But also but... a lot of happiness too. Like that's super cool that all of a sudden, like you have this like opportunity to write like such yeah. a good book. It, well, thank you for saying that. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, do you also write stories and stuff? Uh, yeah, we we, we both write. Um. N- nothing nothing as good as Aru. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> please, uh, please, don't talk about yourself that way. I tried to sell my actual Twilight fan fiction when I was getting started writing. <laughs> 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 we all start somewhere. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, um, me and Sam, uh, a couple years back, and Sam still goes, I, I kind of uh, went off to do other things, but uh, we went to this uh, writing workshop uh, together here in New York uh, called Ritopia, where we would learn to write stories and stuff. And that That's was so super cool. cool. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, the reason I was asking is because there's a there's a weird threshold that you cross all of a sudden when you're published, because your private stories that you're working on, all of a sudden the rest of the world can weigh in and have opinions about it. And sometimes those opinions are great and become like, 
incorrect Twitter accounts, <laughs> which are so, <laughs> so funny. Um, or they become like, here's this thread trashing you on Tumblr. And you're like, cool, cool. Aww. Love this part. I know people can be rude, but people are mostly great. So that's okay. That, that sounds like a mixed experience with uh, fa- fans. So you've, you've um, written young adult books, and then you've also written Amazing Middle Grade, like Aru Shah. So how would you sort of uh, compare the two writings when you have to write for like young adult and middle grade? Um, oh, it's, it's so weird. I mean, I have to get used pretty quickly to writing two books a year. And of course, like one of them is my upper young adult trilogy, The Gilded Wolves, and then the other one is Aru. And I felt like when I was working on either story, um, it really helped clarify things that were happening in the other story. So I would be in the middle of writing The Gilded Wolves and thinking, like, oh my God, that's such a good line to put in Aru, or that makes so much more sense in this other story. And I'd have to keep flip-flopping between all my documents and it was just a mess. Um, but, <laughs> but it's wonderful. They both taught me something. And one thing I've learned for myself, I don't know if other people uh, listening to this will find it helpful, but I keep separate writing candles for both projects. And, and for whatever reason, it works like scent memory so that when I light one candle and I'm working on one story, I'm like, oh, okay, okay, this makes sense. This is the zone that I'm supposed to be in um, versus the other candle. But for some oh. reason, both of them are like flavors of tomato. I don't know why, but tomato candles really help me focus. <laughs> <laughs> They're awesome. They don't smell like spaghetti sauce. They smell like the best kind of dirt. I don't know how else to do it. I- I, I'm sorry. I I think we I think I, I we need to rewrite because I'm still stuck on the part where you you light ca- candles while you're writing. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's like a ceremony or something. My husband will come home and I'm like I have a blanket over myself like a hood and I'm walking creepily around the house. I mean, you can do what you do to get into the mood and <laughs> the zone to write. And is, is this something you've always done? Completely. Wow. I have like so many candles. I don't even, I, I, I look like a witch really when I'm writing. And then if I'm in a bad writing spot, I just pick up the cat and start cradling him and walking around the house. And that's when, that's when I know I need to take a break, but, um, but it works. <laughs> oh, that's, that's super cool that you can like associate like a scent to a certain idea, but like oh, it, ma- yeah. it makes sense that it would help you because it like triggers memories of like the last time that you were writing, which gives you like, Con- con- continuity yeah, from like ex- one ex- yeah. one experience to the other. Yeah, that's always how I thought about it. Um, scent really is memory. There's no way that you can even describe a scent without putting it in a relationship with another smell. And it becomes very subjective for people. So, uh, so yeah, that's one thing I've found that helps me. This explains why whenever I read Arusha, I think of tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew the magic was working. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I think this kind of kind of came up recently, but you know, not a lot of people ta- are are talking about it. But I wanted to ask: Could you maybe tell us the, the story behind the extension of Ari Shah from a four book series to a five book series? Yeah. Um, so the myth that it's based off of, or the Sanskrit epic Mahabharata, uh, there's actually five. Bandava brothers. And for me, I don't want to give too much away, but if you dig a little deeper into the number of Bandava brothers, you'll find that there's actually some discrepancy and it ends up playing a really important part in the myth. And it's actually one of the most tragic parts about it, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. I force you to go Google it on your own. Um, But for me, having to restrain the bond of us siblings to just four books when I knew that there was this other arc I really wanted to explore it would have been too difficult um and so I was really really grateful when Disney let me write a fifth book or has agreed to let me write a fifth book I'm in the middle of book four right now so I know book three just came out but is there anything you yes. can tell us about book four Oh my gosh. Okay. Book four. So far I've written 50,000 words. I'm actually about to 
I'll I'll head out to FedEx later and pick up my printed copy and stuff. Just to I don't know why, but I used to be able to write the whole thing through and then go back and fix it. But then like my hands just started betraying me and falling apart. So now I have to write half the book, correct it, then write the other half and fix it up after that. Um, but let's see, what's happening so far in Arusha and the city of gold? Uh, well, obviously there's gold. Um, and there's also, you might find this interesting. The Greek historian Herodotus once reported that there were supposed to be um, dog-sized ants that lived on the Himalayan and Deccan Plateau. And what they did was dig and burrow into the ground and pour out gold. And so these people would just be like, cool, the gold digging ants have arrived and then just, you know, take the gold and run away with it. And um, I was really fascinated with that because I was like, there are no gold digging ants in India. What are they talking about? <laughs> Turns out it was a mistranslation by our Greek friend. So what he thought were mountain ants were actually like these sort of prairie dog marmots. Oh my and, goodness. Um, wow. Yeah. So, but it was really cute because they would burrow around in the ground. And they'd be, I don't know, looking for bugs or something, but they would pop out and their their fur would just be dusted all over with gold. And they would just shake it off like, what is this useless nonsense and back after an earthworm, you know, and go after it. <laughs> so one of my favorite scenes so far has been writing about uh, the injustice of marmots who want recognition um, <laughs> as they deal with the, the roads of gold. Like, we were never ants. And this is just really bad propaganda. <laughs> and I'm upset. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what, that's, that's what all because of one mistranslation. I know. Can you imagine how sad they were? Their whole PR team just ruined. <laughs> it's like when actors get their big scene edited out. I know. I would cry. <laughs> and and it's and it's just gone. Well, um, yeah, uh, kind of. Well, it it seems that like um, like PR is like a recurring theme in in these books. Is that oh, like yes. <laughs> for a reason or? Um, that's so delightful that you picked up on that. There's not a lot of people who, who ever noticed that. I guess, you know, for me, I've been so extremely fortunate to write stories that have done well in both the young adult and, and middle grade sphere. And yet, um, I sometimes find myself frustrated with, uh, how do I say it? Just with what we expect of creators and how they're supposed to comport themselves and mm -hmm. the cancel culture of so many things like, oh, you said this one thing or you accidentally liked this tweet or whatever. You're clearly like you're killing them <laughs> now, just like a pile of trash. A terrible person. Yeah. Show. Right. And so for right. me, it became this way of looking at that as um, like with all that stuff, you're telling a story about yourself with your branding, with whatever, and you're curating reality, not just for viewers, but also perhaps for yourself. Um, I find playing with Instagram very self-soothing. If I had a bad day, I'll just edit a photo, make it really pretty and post that. And then I feel better, you know, and it's, it's for me and not for someone else. But, but just that question of how much control we give others to portray us uh, is something that I guess has been lingering at the back of my skull for quite some time. Hmm. Oh. Um, <laughs> that's, that, that's like a very important uh, like theme, I feel, or something that needs to be like explored, like given how the world is interacting right now and the state that we're in right now, like mm -hmm. public image and how other people view us has suddenly like become a completely different thing. Yeah, totally. And it's such a weird thing to apply to mythology as well, because, you know, particularly with Hindu mythology, the heroes can do some really bad things and the villains can do some extraordinarily good things. But it's all just about the PR of an ancient storyteller, what they chose to celebrate, who they chose to villainize. Um, and uh, in the immortal words of Hamilton, who lives, who dies and who tells your story. That's a good reference. <laughs> that that is it's something that I that I realized was because all of all of the different like myths and characters from the myth have been like interpreted by the world in so many different ways. And whenever like Aru or um, 
or Minnie or Bryn or the whole team, when they encounter some uh, like new different creature um, or different myth from a different character, there's always like a misconception about them. And, and then like with Opal is kind of like, she's portrayed as like the PR person. And that's kind of like the most literal and obvious one. But there's so many like little bits in which like the perception of the character plays an important role. That's, yeah, I completely agree with you. You know, I don't even think I've ever articulated like out loud why I was doing that. So I'm just sitting here with my mind blown. Like, am I really intelligent? I must be. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm looking at um, my cat, wondering if he agrees and he just yawned at me. So I guess that's a no. You're very rude. (laughs) More questions after this short break. Hey, I just want to pop in and tell you about our sponsor for today's episode. The Veiled Monarch is a new book from Jolly Entertainment about a dystopian world in which a shadowy organization called the Iron Oath keeps humans safe and regulates the non-human communities. As time passes, the Iron Oath loses its grip. The fall of the organization throws the world into a free-for-all struggle that will keep readers like you enthralled. Get The Veiled Monarch on Amazon, Kindle, ebook readers, and coming soon to audible.com. Or visit heyitsjolly.com to get your copy. This is a Diego-approved book. And we're back. And we're back. This is a, a, a kind of a, a simpler question, I guess. But how did you uh, how did you come up with all your character names? Ooh. Oh, my God. Because uh, there's a lot of names. <laughs> I know. Minnie has four. Well, of, oh, God. Let's see. Well, a lot of them are honestly just taken from the actual myths. You know, if they're a character that's mentioned in, in an epic or poem, I just kept them with the same name. But other people, um, I wanted to choose names that may highlight one of their strengths, even if they didn't quite know it yet. Mm-hmm. And actually, Aru's full name, Arundhati, plays a really, really big role in book three. And... Um, yeah, I yeah. When explain it, explain it to her. No, I, I, I read it. Yay! <laughs> I, I, I consumed it right when I got it. I was like, oh. it's here. Hooray! I'm really glad. I, to hear that. I'm so glad to hear that. But yeah, those names were really, really fun to come up with um, and to search through. It was a little disconcerting. Sometimes my parents would drop by our condo or something, and they look at my laptop, and it's just endless baby name websites <laughs> just like what is that why didn't you tell us and i'm sitting here like i'm married by the way but it's just it's fine <laughs> uh, they, they like to panic <laughs> that must be like such an awkward shade. it's like i'm looking up baby names oh what does that mean it's like no no it's for a book you don't understand um. <laughs> So speaking of speaking of your family, uh, Reed Riordan recently released a a really sweet video with with you and your grandmother. Could you maybe? Yes. So th- that video, I think one of the faults of it was that it was too short. Um, <laughs> so could you maybe tell us more about your relationship with Ba and how that influenced uh, Aru Shah as a whole? Oh, yeah. So Ba is actually just Gujarati for a grandmother. Um, and so for me, I I love my grandmother so much. And I am ridiculously indebted to the amazing women in my family who were always my first and foremost storytellers. Um, my grandmother, of course, my mom, who's Filipino and shared a lot of really messed up monsters and ghost stories with me. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> and, um, and my aunt. Um, but my ba was especially the one who got me just hooked on tales of the gods and goddesses and heroes of India. And so when I started thinking even about Arusha, that she was the first person that I called to be like, I think this is something I want to play with. What do you think about it? Or who's your favorite character? And 
I mean, we have a very like, almost collaborative relationship in that sense, where if I can't find something in my own research, I give it to my grandparents and make them go find out. <laughs> and um, they're just the best. They're so supportive. Uh, we talk every week. And I I don't know. I, I'm really glad that we could even record that video because my my grandmother grew up in a really strange time. It was after the British um, left India. Mm-hmm. Obviously, they were one of the main colonizers. Um, and she's so smart, but she didn't have nearly as many opportunities that we have here and that I think we so often take for granted. So mm-hmm. she didn't have schooling past eighth grade in India. Mm-hmm. And yet she's still one of the smartest people I've ever met. And she came to the United States with my dad and my uncle. They were both under the age of eight. She came here alone to find my grandfather, who was finishing up school as a civil engineer. She worked in factories to the point that she got tinnitus. She taught herself English by watching soap operas. I mean, (laughs) she's literally a legend. Um, and, and yet, you know, she can cook, clean, do all these things, like feed an army and still have time at the end of the day to want to, like, scratch my head and tell me a story. She's just Aww, my hero. That's so cute. <laughs> um, have you shown her any of, like, the, the, the fan mail she's gotten since that video came out? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, she's really, she's really basking in it, guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm sending her screenshots of what people say and how much they like her and blah, blah, blah. Um, and she's delighted. She's really, she's really, really delighted. Oh. That's, it's it's amazing to have like someone who like a, a figure that you can kind of like look up to and aspire to because it sounds like she's like a really like strong and persistent person oh yeah I feel like all the women in my family are like that I mean my grandmother's story is incredible my mom she she's a nurse and she came to the United States when she was 26 on St. Patrick's Day and was completely confused <laughs> you know, like what the hell is this every day? I got to go back. <laughs> All these um, and, you know, raised me and my two siblings and just always made things seem effortless. Like we were, we never had a reason to be scared. We were always inspired by the stories our parents would tell us. Uh, I was, I grew up really, really just fortunate. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Parents, parents play like a very important role in life and having like, like amazing parents is just amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I uh, kind of like you, along those lines, you grew up with these stories and other people may have like grown up with the stories as well, but different versions of them. With all like these different versions, and obviously you mentioned that there was some discrepancy about how many Pandava brothers there were. How did you choose which myths and which versions of the myths to use? Oh, I love this question. Um, you know, for me, I I just went to the myths that had either stuck with me because they were so beautiful and I wanted to play with them more, or myths where I thought somebody had gotten the short end of the stick. Um, for example, the villain <laughs> in Arushan, The Song of Death, maybe has three lines in the Ramayana. Um, Mm -hmm. And yet I found her so compelling. I wanted to know what happened to her. Why did she do that? Um, And was she treated well in the myth, even though the person who was extremely cruel to her was a deity? Um, So yeah, for me, when I'm thinking about myths to share or something, I'm really thinking about what's the emotional cost to that character in the story. Yeah, I think that definitely played out in Arusha too, because there was like so much indecision, rightful indecision, when you like don't know really who who was the who was in the wrong in that myth. Yeah, and and all the different perspectives offer a different angle or something, and you see that like the point of view of the character and understanding the truth and like what does the truth mean. Like, what is the truth and what is just, like, a different perception of the same story? Mm-hmm. So, do, do you have a favorite character from Arusha? Ooh. Um, my gosh. I, 
I really do have a soft spot for Aru. I just, she's just wild. She has no idea what she's doing. <laughs> she's just trying to figure it out along the way. Um, and I'm very proud of her. But other sort of, I mean, I really enjoy writing Boo. Um, and something happens with Boo at the end of book three. And I don't know. <laughs> I'm really curious to see what people think of it. But I hope they trust me. Um in terms of where I'm taking yeah. his story. I think, I think Rick Riordan's a bad influence on you. <laughs> Rick Riordan's a bad influence on you. I'm going to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, but honestly, what the what is it? The character that I really, really liked writing, though, in book one is actually the Palace of Illusions. Um, when I like moved from home, I was born in St. Louis, and we came to Georgia when I was like in kindergarten, I cried and I sobbed and I missed my old house so much that I just wanted to know if it missed me too. And that ended up being a chapter where I cried a lot. <laughs> so, like, thinking about the poor palace. I think that abandoned. was a sad chapter for a lot of people. It was very, <laughs> the, the poor house. Just... I know. It's just like, hello, did everybody forget about me? It's just like so sad. Is anybody there? Yeah. Is anybody uh, there? Sorry, sorry. Left behind. Uh, about your about your soft spot for Aru, I think especially from the the very first chapter of End of Time, she's so uh, relatable in that kind of struggling through through middle school, which I think is uh, what not just middle schoolers can relate to, but pretty much anyone who's ever been through middle school. Uh. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that. So another character question, but like, what similarities do you share with all the characters from Arusha, especially the main ones like Bryn, Mini, Aiden, Aru, and Boo? Oh, wow. Um, well, I mean, Aru, to be honest, I gave her a lot of my own personality, uh, particularly as I was figuring myself out in middle school. I also had the reputation for being a liar, and I also had an overactive imagination. Um, unfortunately, I still do. Otherwise, I don't know how I'd write. <laughs> um, and, you know, that sort of thing, like this deep yearning to be proven special, to, to think that you're meant for something more. I gave that to Aru. Um, with Minnie, I gave her a lot of my own just, I, I think I have a, a lot more Ravenclaw tendencies than I thought. Um, I really, <laughs> I really like being able to control a situation around me. And sometimes knowledge is, if all I have is knowledge until just sort of research a subject until I know everything about it, then I feel better. And so Minnie definitely has an obsessive quality. Um, she's also half Filipino like me. And although there hasn't been as much space to play with that story, I know that it's something that um, is complicated for her to belong to two cultures and not really feel like you're enough of either one. So that's something that certainly lives inside her. Uh, with Bryn, <laughs> Bryn and I are very similar in the sense that our love language is food. I mean, if we don't know what to do. Like, can I make you something to eat? Like, <laughs> something like that. Um, actually, during quarantine, I've just been cooking nonstop elaborate opera cakes. I made a frangipan almond and plum tart yesterday. I'm making macarons later like braised lamb, blah, 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 extraordinary rare wines, you name it, I'll eat it and drink it probably. So, <laughs> um, so definitely gave that to Bryn. <laughs> so many people tuned into your Instagram stream and then it was technical, difficulty, technical difficulties, <laughs> uh, food discussions, <laughs> and yeah, that, it, but you, you did talk about the book. But. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was fun. I hope I hope you guys enjoyed it. My poor husband was like, "Am I on this?" I was like, "Yes, please wear clothing." <laughs> <laughs> Quarantine's getting to all of us. Um, and uh, you know, for the character Aiden, it's I mean, I really love Aiden. I really enjoyed giving him essentially all female powers, like things that we associate with women. I just gave it to Aiden, and I wanted to see what he would do with it. Um, and he's like the sad mama bear of the group who's just like trying to keep everybody in line and what's happening and he loves photography um and he's, and he's not a pandava like, he's not no he's like pandava adjacent um and he's he's my take on a broody like broody hero um and i i don't know i give a lot of traits to him also the way that I, I don't know if this is what, whatever. I 
happened to meet my my husband um, because I I watched his house being built over summer like a creep when I was 15. And then the first time I saw him, he's extraordinarily good looking. Like if you imagine like a sexy Jafar, that's who I married. Um, but the first time I saw him, I was just shocked that he was like cuter than I thought he would be. And so I ended up yelling out, hey, you, I know where you live. Like really, really loud. Um, and that was a mistake because we then carpooled and he didn't speak to me for a year. But Aww. gotcha in the end. I just kept showing up because I knew where I lived and now we're married. So. you. I know where you live. Yeah. Don't, um, don't use that line. <laughs> well, I don't know. Ari said it. You said it. It seems to work pretty well. <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to find out. Um, what happens between our room? Oh yeah, uh, can, well, do, 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 yes, do, do we, we shall see. Do we know what's going to happen? Do we? Not know? <laughs> do we? I don't know. I certainly don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that one. Um, this is kind of like a, a side question, but what what is the like most extravagant thing that you've cooked? Oh my gosh. Most extravagant thing. Okay. Well, or, or most extravagant things if you're having a hard time picking. Yeah. Well, we made, I say we, but it was honestly really me. Uh, I made gnocchi <laughs> from scratch um, and it was delicious. Oh. I used Yukon gold potatoes so that the gnocchi was really, really just tender and naturally buttery. Um, then we, I made a ragu sauce that had like San Marzano tomatoes and it took like four hours and it was braised with, um, lamb ragu that had been like seasoned and spiced separately. Um, and that was served with the 2012 Valpolicella, which was delicious. And then the next day for dessert, that's when I made the opera cake, which took like, oh, like a whole day. You have to make a sponge cake separately and it's got egg white meringue folded into it uh, as like the raising agent because there's no baking soda. And then you have to make a chocolate ganache, a chocolate syrup separately, a coffee buttercream separately, and then you layer it and layer it and layer it. It takes the whole day. <sighs> yeah. Just delicious. <laughs> oh, that, that sounds good. I, I wonder if our heroes are going to eat it in book five. Probably. They have one. Like at the I end, know. it's just victorious and they're just eating your favorite dishes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Ooh. That would be great. Bryn can force That's everyone to help her bake. I don't think Bryn <laughs> trusts anybody to help her bake because Aru would be the type yeah. that would just like hide in a corner with the, all the icing and then Minnie would just be I behind her and just <laughs> yelling like, you're going to get a stomach ache, then you're going to die. And Aiden would be trying to photograph things and being like, this is why I can't take candid photos of you. You look like a goblin. <laughs> <laughs> That, that'd be such a like great scene like with all of them just kind of sitting around and like playing their characters and Bryn just kind of like sighing like how am I going to get this done if you guys aren't helping yeah she'd be so grumpy <laughs> maybe that can be your nachos after the war uh, as, as Ooh. it is um, oh yeah <laughs> that's very important very important uh, <laughs> but Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Diego, do you have any last questions? No, no. I I, I was just curious uh, about the dishes, but no, I, no, no further questions from Mom. <laughs> this was so fun. Thank you guys so much for having me. Oh, thank you. It was an honor. Everyone, make sure to order uh, Arusha and the Tree of Wishes if you hadn't already. It's a great book, and it's the third installment of the... Is it the Pandava series or the Arusha series? That's something I've wondered. Uh, me too. I don't know. You guys will let me decide. <laughs> or let decide and let me know. Wow. I have no idea. Oh, I like them both. So it's the uh, Arusha and the Pandavas series. Book three. <laughs> Rosh, uh, how can people find your website, your social media, anything people should know? Oh, yeah. It's just first and last name, Roshni Chashi. And you'll find me on all the things and where I'm often posting about things I'm eating, drinking, and the cat. <laughs> all very important. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Have a good one. You too. Uh, all right. Good luck. Bye. Good luck on the virtual book tour. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> bye. And that's it for this episode of the Half-Blood Report. 
Samuel, how can I contact this podcast? Uh, you can find us on Twitter, where we are most active, at Half Report. Um, make sure to tweet at us uh, compliments, questions, corrections, or suggestions. You can also find us on Instagram at the Half Blood Report. Email us at uh, the Half Blood Report at gmail.com. You can also find our website where you can listen to any of our episodes, thehalfbloodreport.com. Uh, and you can also contact us for that. We also have a Patreon, uh, which is in the show notes. And that said, it's time for credits. Our music on this podcast is actually by me. And I do most of our editing. My co-host here is Diego, and I'm Samuel. This is the Half-Blood Report podcast. The only HBR that matters. We'll see you next week. I'm Roshni Chakshi. I'm the author of the Irish Shot series, and I definitely do not listen to the Half-Blood Report.